Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar interview. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Enfield Voices and this is one of the many webinars we do that looks at major issues globally, nationally and locally. And today we're going to look at a local issue which actually has global ramifications and that's we're going to look at local parks and how one park is trying to get other parks as well to do what they're doing and that's to look at a strategy for climate change and biodiversity in their parks and getting them together to talk about it and discuss it and they're starting that themselves and that's what we're going to talk about today and we've got Kim Lumley with us who's from one of the parks a very attractive beautiful park in in Enfield which is a, a borough in the north of London and he's a member of the Friends of Bruegel Park. He's been working with them. So thanks for joining us, Kim, and it's great you're with us today. So in order to start this, do you think you could tell us a little bit about yourself when you got involved in your involvement? Yeah, um, I'm a retired doctor. I was a GP in Whetstone for over 30 years, and uh, I retired about four years ago. I've, throughout my life, I've, I've always been interested in nature and wildlife and um, I spent a lot of time with my wife walking countryside around the country and um, so I was, I was we also we lived between Groveland's and Broomfield Park and um, we spent a lot of time walking we used to have dogs so we'd walk every day in parks um, and during that time I, I called in um, in the community orchard, which was set up by David March and, and the council, which is a, the most fabulous space, and uh, got talking and thought that'd be a, a great place to go and get involved. And so when I retired, um, I went and started helping with, with in the orchard with a, another project with uh, a new wild, wildlife pond. Um, and I, I was a beekeeper already, but I became a beekeeper in the orchard. Um, and so that was my introduction and um, I've ca carried on since and um, I've been co-chair with, with David March for the last couple of years, or we've come up to two years now. And, uh, and, you, and you are passionate about Bloomfield, aren't you? I mean, what is there about Bloomfield Park that makes you love it so much? Um, I, th I think it's, I mean, it's, it's partly what, you know, what is, what is there and, and the history of what was there. Um, so it's got its uh, history dating back to the 16th century with a house, and although it's sort of a, a burnt down, it's still quite an interesting, and as I've, I've devoted quite a lot of time to that with others locally. Um, but it's lovely having the walls and the brock ponds, the brock lakes, and the boating pond. And um, and there are a lot of special things that go on in there. And they're, they're, they've been a over the years, I've been a group of very inspirational individuals or small groups who've actually started up projects which have developed, and um, so some of those are really quite magical. I was, I was it, to get involved, but it, it you know, as attractive as it is, it's not a big park, but it's a beautifully yeah. landscaped, but it's also a community place, isn't it? There are lots of community events there, there's a, a festival every year. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, bands playing in the bandstand and it's, it really brings people together. Yes, well, that, that's been a big thing that we've developed over, the, the festival has been running for a long time but, and blues, but um, really over the last couple of years, um, uh, we've been working very hard to develop community events and we've been working to uh, make a relationship with the council to allow us to do that. And uh, it's worked really well. And uh, there's another uh, David Williams, who a lot of people would know from Talkies, has joined us, and he's he's uh, behind loads of events. And this year we would have had a full program, more or less, you know, every every week going through the summer. So it's a, a real shame that those have all been cancelled. Um, but they'll they'll we'll be back again as soon as we can. Yeah, I'm sure sure they'll be back because everyone loves to go in there and, and getting involved in those things. But you're not just interested, are you, in the park as a place for environmental enjoyment and for community engagement. You also believe, don't you, that it has a very significant role it can play in biodiversity and addressing climate change and that you're looking at that, aren't you? Yes, but it's 
I'd say the, the environmental part of it has been going on probably for 10 years without maybe calling it that, but um, uh, a group uh, restored the, the conservatory and uh, they've, they've got a collection of exotic plants there, including fruiting banana trees, and it's, it's a, that's, that's really wonderful. The community orchard again was set up 10 years ago. There, there are 100 trees in there, 40 different uh, old English varieties. Um, with meadow and hedgerow and bees, we make our own honey there. Um, but going on from that, we've, we've, we've been interested in developing habitat around the park. Um, and uh, so we, we, one of the next projects was a wildlife pond, um, which was created again, again, very much with the help of the council. Um, that was quite a big project. Um, and a wild flower garden, which is divided into a, a perennial bed and an annual bed. Um, that's been quite a challenge battling with the weeds and we're going through the process at the moment and getting some help from a Capel Manus uh, work experience student um, to really try and to, to turn it into a, a, a meadow that could be more easily sustainably managed. Um, we've got a growing, growing space. We grow, um, the idea is that we have community coming in and uh, growing food products and finding things to do with them. But that's that's something we're hoping to develop more. Is this something that, you know, has been the the, the inspiration of one person or is everyone on board with this? No, there, 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 are, it, there are a lot of uh, inspirational people there. There's another who set up a community cafe, um, uh, which is very successful. Um, and uh, there have been various people, you know, other people who, who were behind the pond and the wildflower garden, either Evans or one. Um, and so we've been very lucky to have those people and uh, they've followed through. In between them, they've got um, really large groups of volunteers and uh, they need them to keep their, their, their bits going. But that, in, in a way, that's been a problem for me because I'm trying to get volunteers for other things in the park. And when you've already got over over hundreds doing things on a on a regular basis, trying to get more is is more challenging. So where where do you get your volunteers from, and are they from all ages and uh, you know different backgrounds? Yeah. Um, the I mean I'd say the majority of the volunteers in the past were of a of a particular age, um, uh, like us and. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there were some some uh, younger ones and families who had come, and particularly when we do um, big projects, do a call out that a lot of people come um, for things in the orchard and elsewhere. But uh, when we when we started changing things with the events last year, that was a, a big thing we were looking at. How how can we increase our volunteers, but particularly looking to expand. Uh, people are coming in so we want to do, try and get young people particularly people from different backgrounds coming in um, families and it's quite challenging to see how you're going to, to reach those groups we did we did some survey work uh, but the, uh, the the young youngsters up to 18 don't don't bother answering any surveys um, but we developed um, a new website which is a lot of work um, and we link that in with our Facebook page and, and we do uh, MailChimp news shots. And we've had quite a reach from that. I think I was just looking, we had, I think we had something like 70,000 page views on our website in the first year. Um, and so we get quite a lot of people uh, answering our volunteer page. Um, I, um, I mean, I, I've actually seen your website and I think it's really a really fantastic site and I think you've really done well on that. When you get volunteers, young people and older people, do they have different interests in terms of dealing with climate change and biodiversity and so on? Or do they all have the same agenda? I think uh, I would say particularly that the uh, ones coming with families do. Um, I mean, some of them, we've got other um, groups. We've got a big, now we've got a regular big group of Duke Duke of Edinburgh volunteers who come every Sunday and they've done a lot of the uh, tree planting, hedgerow planting. And so they're, they're very much in tune with the environmental side of it. Um, 
one of the interesting groups we've had is um, uh, called Reach, and they're a, um, a project uh, run by uh, Enfield Council uh, to help uh, excluded year nine kids back into school. And they go, they're, they're out of school for two months uh, in a project that's run in Edmonton. And they come and work with us uh, usually eight or nine at a time, one day a week. And uh, that's been really good. So, and, and of course, they're from very different backgrounds from uh, a lot of people that we, we're usually working with. And do you work with schools at all in terms of environmental yes. and sustainability things? Yeah, we, we have. Um, we've, we've, for a long time, we've had um, uh, primary school visits, year visits. And so local schools like Hazelwood and Walker um, and some others come in. Um, in the past, it was sort of half history of the park and looking around, going to the conservatory, coming to the orchard. But we've moved more around to some more practical stuff to do with the environment. So we can take them into, a big part of it is then seeing the bees and trying on the bee suits and things. Um, we've now got our wildlife pond so we can pond it there and, and look at creatures. And uh, they go to the conservatory, they always love it in the conservatory. Um, and of course, we've now got the new new wetland, which gives us a, a whole new dimension to talk about. And um, so that's part of our uh, evolving action plan is we want to uh, sort of make that more sophisticated and, and yes, focus on issues like environment and climate change and that. I'm sure they'll be interested in that. Try to get the, the teachers talking about it before they come in. We can do special projects on it. Okay. Another one. Yes, sorry. Another one of my colleagues, Helen Blair, and is she's she's our school rep, and she's been um, setting up a resource trolley and all sorts of resources. So, um, yeah, we're going to try and plan that a bit more and and make the best of it. So, I mean, you you you're obviously looking at the whole area of climate change and so on. Um, what are the benefits do you think that urban parks can bring to the climate change imperative? It's, it's interesting looking, starting to research it, look around, there's an awful lot written about it, a lot of appreciation of, of the, the importance of urban parks. Um, and although they're not, uh, a park like ours is a massive area and it's not going to, can't do anything that's going to stop climate change, um, there are various ways it, it has an important impact on it. And um, those are, I mean, it has a role in prevention. Obviously, our, our trees absorb carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. Uh, the big uh, broadleaf trees we have are very good at sequestering carbon. Uh, it's not just in the tree itself, but in their roots. Um, um, but perhaps more it's in mitigation or, or resilience. So things like improving air quality, particularly thinking about planting hedgerow around um, and having, having a lot of trees. Um, you get absorption of particulates and, and nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide and things. Someone's actually typed in a rather interesting point, and that is, you know, there's there's a lot of scientific evidence now to say that pesticides are damaging the environment. Do you get involved in that in terms of what happens in Broomfield Park? Well, yes. I mean, obviously, we we can't control everything that happens, but we we talk about it. Uh, we we've, we've made a policy ourselves not to use chemical treatments. Um, so we don't use herbicides or pesticides, um, which that, that's led to a huge amount of work for me and, and large groups of volunteers on the wildflower garden because um, the, the, the soil is there is too rich really for a wildflower garden. So it's, it's, it has been taken over by um, thistles, which are very difficult to get rid of. So we've had a, a, a few years where we're having to do it all manually, um, but no, we don't, we don't use chemicals we have as a policy. Okay, well I'm sure Adam who raised that point will be pleased to hear that. Um, so I mean you know you're, you're trying to develop a strategy um, and you're trying to reframe your initiatives. Now what's the process of that? How are you going about doing that? Um, well at the moment we're, we're just ha having come to NCAF and listened to you and, and, and thought about it. it seemed reasonable to go back and actually look at what we're doing um, at the moment in, in environmental terms um, and 
look at that against um, various documents from government and, and, and the mayor and MPL council. Um, the, the, the government put out their 25 year plan two years ago and, and the mayor also. And they had a lot of good points in there. Uh, they're very relevant, but uh, there's not anything really about how they're going to achieve it in parks. Um, and uh, certainly no statutory funding for parks. And of course, that's a big issue now because the local authorities, whatever the budget they used to have, and even their parks department within the council are all, all gone. So um, we can't look to them for funding things. I mean, they do when they can, and they, they raise money from other sources. Well, you know, you're, you're quite right. I mean, very often when at the mayor's office or the council level, you know, the world is full of good intentions, but if you actually try to put substance on it, you find it very difficult. Is that something you're trying to do, like finding what the main components of your strategy will be? And have you got to the stage where you've sort of prioritised yet? We've, we've, um, we've we identified um, eight areas, um, and that's really looking at the, those, the documents I was referring to before. Uh, things like um, health benefits and well-being, education engagement, biodiversity and habitat, clean air, improving water quality. And we've gone through those and looked what what we're contributing to at the moment in those. Um, and uh, we put in, on each section, we put in uh, next steps to say what we're thinking about. Now it's, it's what we have to do now, we have to use this to develop our action plan. We do, we, we do an action plan, which we agree with the council we follow that through through the year and um, that's a, a bit of a complicated process um, and we're, we're engaged with that but I want what I want is for us all to be thinking about climate action and um, look and see if anything that we're doing can be um, you said reframed looked at in a way that, that that is is relevant to that so there are areas like waste management um, Trees in particular, trees are going to be a big project for us. And I think um, we have, there's not scope for planting forests in a park like Broomfield, but what we do have is a, a, a large uh, perimeter and a lot of really lovely uh, mature trees. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of those are suffering. Um, lots of horse chestnuts have got quite severe canker and several of them have died and fallen down already. But if you, if you go and look, a lot of them, are, I don't think, are going to last for five or ten years. Um, and we've had two big two big willow trees that have fallen down. And I think the council would like to replace those, but they just they haven't got the budget for that. So the only tree replacement we're seeing at the moment is with memorial trees. So we try to pass people on to do that whenever we can. Um, but we're, we're um, again, David March is, is heading a, a project which we're about to work out to really do, a, do an assessment and talk to the tree officers who come, come to see us from the council and really make some sort of plan about what might go back in those tree spaces and either look for uh, funding in other sources to pay for it or um, another idea which seems very good is to create a tree nursery. And, and the great thing of that is that you can um, take seedlings from good trees, you know, that have heritage in park um, and um, other local sources, the Enfield Society have got tree nursery and they've offered us trees should we need them. But with the idea that over the next five or 10 years, um, we actually have a plan of, of, of trees that can be used to replace them without, without costing the council a large amount of money. So yeah, developing a strategy, you've got eight areas in which you're working on, and that's in Broomfield itself. But that's you're cool. also fairly ambitious, aren't you, in that you want to involve other parks in Enfield and see how you can get to together to sort of have a strategy for parks generally in the borough, is that right? Yeah, well, we, we have um, a consortium of Friends of Parks, um, but um, most of the meetings I've been to are concerning sort of immediate problems that are happening. And there's, there's always a lot to talk about. Um, I think for, for things like this to, to be effective, it would obviously be, be good if everyone in all the green spaces and parks were 
thinking in these terms and seeing what, what they could do. But in particular, um, sharing ideas, um, you know, because uh, I know lots of people in really good parks in Enfield and really good things going on. So there are ideas and skills and resources. Um, and it would be very nice if uh, we could share those and perhaps partner on, on some projects. I mean, I think, I think the really important thing is for us is getting, getting people in and not just volunteers, but we want, you know, park visitors, schools, um, all sorts coming in and, and feeling that they can engage. And if they're, if they're there, we can raise the issues of climate change, perhaps uh, involve them in activities that uh, might stimulate, stimulate them to uh, go home and do things themselves. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I noticed you said after the NCAF meeting, you sort of began to develop some ideas. I know after the NCAF meeting, some teachers also got together and before the coronavirus outbreak happened, they were going to meet in a pub and talk over how schools would get together. So, I mean, are you hoping that you might get teachers involved who have a very passion about climate change and they can work with you on this? Yes, absolutely. We, we went, I actually went around the, the Hazelwood teachers, I went and spoke to her and said, please um, think next year about using us as a resource for this because we've got apart from school visits we've got the growing space they can bring small groups classes they could come after school um and and do things in there and and the wetlands a great place to, to visit we can help support that but in your in your working with other park friends of other parks and so on I, as your first stage from what i gather you were saying is to share information uh, about what each other's doing and then to see where you can go on from there yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I sent out a note to the consortium. Obviously, with the current situation, the usual meetings aren't happening, and things have gone very quiet. Um, but it would be very nice. I, I mean, I think the NCAF would be a good forum for some of the other friends groups to attend. We've got Carol here from Bush Hill Park uh, at, at the moment, which is great. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, as I said, there, there are so many other great parks with things going on. Um, it's a matter of finding finding ways and, and perhaps having that as a bit of a focus, which we haven't had before. Or maybe we have, maybe I don't know about it yet. I'll find no, out. That's it. I mean, it's interesting to say you don't know about it because there's so many things going on in the borough that none of us know about. Yeah. And in a way, one of the deficiencies in Enfield is there's no community mapping, there's no social mapping about what's going on, yeah. which happens in many other boroughs. I mean, is that something that would help you if you ha if you knew exactly what was happening in other yeah. areas and there was a map you could look at and you could link into that, you could find out people's strengths, you could find out what people want, and you could bring them together. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Things, I mean, we've, we've got a wetland now um, that the councillor, um, uh, they had it put it, Thames 21 put it in um, and they were great, but uh, we, we will need to uh, play a role in helping to manage it um, and there are places like First Farm where they're, they're you know they've, they've got their fantastic wetland they're, they're well ahead of the game and um, I was in Enfield Town Park today another lovely part of the part of the wetland there and Groveland's have got one so I think there's probably a lot of scope for, for, for sharing things um, part of the problem is just that everyone's working so hard finding the time to go somewhere else is quite difficult but Perhaps we can work out a way for some give and take. I know, and also your volunteers, like we are, and volunteers always have so many demands on them, and volunteers come and go as well. So it's always difficult to get the consistency you would want. But how, are you managing to get information out to people, and particularly young people, about what you're doing? Not not just on the environment, but your climate change strategy and your climate change discussions. Do you find it's, a way of getting it's, that it's, information it's, out? It's very early days yet. Um, I mean, our, our Facebook page is very useful for that, and particularly for young families, um, Mumsnet joined, and that's been a, a good way of getting things out to young kids. We've just had, we've had a really successful um, series of paintings, spring paintings sent in over the last, last week uh, with that. Um, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we can do, once we start having our events, um, that's a really good forum to, to talk about things. We can put up a gazebo and have displays and perhaps get some of you from NCAF to come, come down. 
and very much use those as a as a place to, to start engaging people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, engaging people is incredibly difficult, but at least we have the social networks now to do it, which we, we don't in the past. So, you know, what are your plans in going forward? I mean, how do you see things developing? Yeah, but the other thing I should say is that the, the best thing about uh, doing this is all great, it's huge fun. And um, we want to try and get that across as well. And the I hope the, I don't know if you've seen the full document on the website, but there are lots of photographs of uh, young people having fun in there. So, um, so our next stage, we've, we've just really, we've just, we've produced the document, we making changes this week, we put it on the website and put out a news shot on it. Um, for us, the next stage is for, uh, to, get, uh, to get our action plan agreed and feed some of this into it. And then, um, then we have to start uh, negotiating that with the council. Um, and then, you know, it's going to depend on COVID. We've got, we finally managed to drain, have the uh, boating bond drained and we can clean it out. Um, but uh, we can't go and touch it for the moment. So that's uh, very frustrating. Unfortunately, that's taken seven years to get to that stage. And I mean, do you have contacts with the council now who know what you're doing and can help? Oh, yeah. Or yeah. No, is no, it no. a difficult time at the moment? Uh, that would be very, very, I mean, that they are very busy, um, of course, and I think short staff, staff doing other things. But uh, I mean, they, you know, they, they're coming in and cutting the grass and um, other things in the park. And in fact, some of the cemetery workers um, who weren't, cemetery gardeners came, but weren't allowed to go into cemetery gardens. They came and did a really good job clearing out uh, in the park a couple of weeks ago. Um, but no, the very, very, uh, uh, the parks business unit who we go through directly because we've got, there hasn't been a uh, liaison officer for some time. They're very responsive. Hakima Karoti there, she's great. Okay, so just look, five years from now, where would you like to be? Um, in a world without any cars or aeroplanes? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, what there, there, there are an awful lot of projects there and once we've got we've got them in place, it's getting them used and um, and uh, maintaining them. Just you know, just to it's not standing still because they're things that are growing. But it's it's an awful lot of work that's, that's needed for that. And that's you know now a part that used to have a, a team of nine gardeners has has two starting a, uh, a project called Build Up, um, where a, a specialist team of uh, community workers come and build a project or well, they don't build they, they get young people together to uh, think of an idea design it and build it and, and use it do you think as well that you know the covid crisis that we're facing now will make more people appreciative of the parks once it's over we know that for example the sale of bikes are going up the you know, the, the desire to get back to nature is happening. Do you think there would be a sort of benefit if you can use that word? It's not a good word to use, but do you think parks will actually find themselves in a resurgence because of what people have been through now? We're very much hoping so. I mean, part, you know, people, people are out in the parks now who, who might not normally go so regularly. So they're actually experiencing it. It's been nice weather. Um, and you know, surely, uh, I'm sure people are going to be feeling different for some time after and, and valuing things that more they might not have before. And, um, you know, if you can't go out and ha to restaurants, you can't go out driving your car so much, why not go into the park and not be using electricity or petrol, but be doing, doing something that's good fun and, um, uh, and, and putting something back in for all our futures. Okay, so fine, final question then is, if people wanted to get in touch with you, get involved, help in any way, where would they go? Who would they contact? If you go, go to our website, uh, www.friendsofbroomfieldpark.org, um, and then at, at, at the top picking list, you'll see a, a thing for volunteers, and then you can, um, you can send in a, a, a request there or, or a question. 
Okay. Oh, well, that's great. Well, thank you for doing this, Kim, because I think a lot of people will be interested in this. Lots of people enjoy the parks, they're interested in it. And the fact that you're looking at a, a climate change, change strategy, looking at biodiversity, is, I think, something that will interest a lot of people as time goes by. So I think what you're doing is inspiring because you will, you, I think you will inspire other friends of parks in, in this borough and indeed in other boroughs uh, when they see what's happening to do the same. And I hope you do that and you can work with the council and you can develop a strategy. And I really do appreciate your working through NCAF because I think we can do a lot together. So thank you for doing it. And I really appreciate you coming along now. And we'll finish this webinar interview now.